So Michael, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you and to introduce what we hope to be an amazing period of time where we get to talk about the work going on in Broward County. We believe that we can have both excellence and equity, that we are preparing today's students for tomorrow's world by raising the level of opportunity and therefore the level of experiences that our students have. Because by having a deep, rich set of experiences that are intentional, surrounded by both personalized and case managed education, we can produce excellence for all. That all piece is the equity question. And today during our, G, our ASU GSV virtual summit, you're gonna hear from many of the partners that we have here in Broward County. You're gonna hear about how we are trying to make sure that we are empowering students to be owners of not only their learning in the classroom, but the artifacts of that learning, that we are able to scale their education to the scale of the internet. You'll hear from partners about an internet of education, an education 3.0 revolution that's moving us forward, that we here in Broward have been very fortunate to participate in and are deploying now. Additionally, you're gonna hear about partners with whom we have deep curriculum integration who are inspirations to us, specifically the Algebra Project and the Young People's Project, who understand that it's not just mathematical fluency that needs to come out of formal education, but it's the ability to learn how to learn how to learn for oneself and with others, and to ensure that students understand that civic life, participation as a learner after graduation is a civil right that is both the fluency to read and the fluency to represent. We want to ensure that students are masters of both languages and logics, and that is what we are trying to do. We also know that many of our students struggle and you'll hear from one of our partners, Saga Education, about the kinds of things we're trying to do to intervene in students prior to their graduation to make sure that we have raised that level of equity for all. You'll hear from other partners as well, all sewn together by a joint commitment. A joint commitment to be students of our own practice, to make sure that our resources both human, technological, and in term, both human and technological are what we do moving forward. Michael, there's great things happening in Broward County and I am so fortunate to be doing it. And I wanna thank ETS as a major partner who has really moved us forward and your support of the Algebra Project and our commitment is reflected in what the entire community will hear from us today. So thank you. So Broward is large, we have the challenge of scale. We've got 280,000 students across our entire system, including our public charter schools. We're trying to make sure that we can address the needs of urban diverse America, because what Broward County is now in terms of the breadth of socioeconomic status, the breadth of cultural background, the questions of racial inequity that we have inherited from previous generations, those questions need to be addressed now. And we hope that for all the stumbles and mistakes we will make, we will have enough successes to show that what our ideals are can be lived in our practices. We know that what we have done has been insufficient and we are committed to doing better and making our efforts transparent for the rest of the country to learn with, hopefully from us as we do from them. We're gonna turn our attention now to two leaders in the tech world in the US and around the globe. Um, there are two components, major components to the Broward County Public School District CoLab. One is improving and upgrading student achievement and performance uh, across all demographic groups. And another major component is for the school district to move aggressively into the digital world and to replace our, uh, conventional technologies with new technologies. A major part of that is uh, the Internet of Education. 
We have uh, two leaders, Chris Purifoy, the uh, CEO of Learning Economy Foundation, and, and Greg Nadeau, a manager at the uh, Public Consulting Group. Welcome. Chris, what can you tell us about the Internet of Education and how it's going to help Broward County Public School District? Uh, thanks, Michael. Yeah, you know, um, so first I just want to say thank you uh, for having us here. I think this is an important, uh, you know, it's an important forum to discuss these types of ideas. And uh, the Internet of Education, uh, it, it seems to be at the top of the mind of so many people we're working with these days. So, so let me actually just share a couple slides and we can, we can just jump right in. Um, you know, with our work at Learning Economy Foundation, we have been seeing more and more uh, in the private public sector, the need for new infrastructures, especially in light of what's happened uh, with COVID and such, you know, there's a real need for uh, leapfrogging into new education and employment infrastructures uh, that empower the learners and the employees. And so, so what we have seen, you know, over the past, you know, six to nine months when uh, the Internet of Education really began, uh, it's, it's been a bit of a hockey stick, you know, things have, have really jumped into gear. Uh, and, and to really understand why, I think, it, it is at the root of, you know, the problems it's, uh, it's attempting to solve, really. Uh, and they're the most existential threats we have in education, right? Uh, you know, and, and for us, the theory of change is in the top, in the top center. The idea here is that uh, our systems uh, aren't speaking to each other. There's fragmentation between the universities and the schools and the employers and the agencies. And this fragmentation creates... Uh, it makes it very difficult for human capital investors to invest wisely and make impact and to know where their dollars are making impact because they're making a lot of guesses. Uh, and we're learning that skills gaps are growing everywhere because of this, equity gaps are growing, et cetera. And so the way that we began to make that change is up in the top right quadrant, or quadrant which is that uh, the learners and the employees don't have access to their own records and their data. And what we really need is we need to start the work there by uh, creating a bit of a nexus uh, with the centered you know, architecture on the learner and on the employee. And from that, we can start to solve all of these other uh, just really tough challenges, you know. Again, just to reiterate, the idea here is that every silo in education and employment aren't communicating. Their systems are fragmented, and this really creates, um, you know, this whole ordeal. And so inter-trusted learner networks, really, you know, these are networks in which uh, they have a trust built in so that we can begin to uh, understand how to transfer those records uh, seamlessly, uh, you know, across borders, across institutions, uh, you know, from uh, learner to learner, et cetera, as needed to, uh, to solve these challenges. And, uh, and one great effort uh, I'm undertaking uh, creating that kind of infrastructure to support it is the Trust Over IP Foundation. Uh, and I'd like to show this slide. This is probably the most technical slide of all, but it's a really interesting one because What's happening here, you know, if you think about uh, the paradigm shift from the check to the credit card, uh, this is the paradigm shift from the transcript to the verifiable credential, really. You know, the idea here is that in the traditional banking system, organizations like MasterCard have made it really scalable for many different uh, banks to, um, to transfer finances between many different retailers on behalf of many different individuals. And they can do that live on the spot with a credit card. Uh, instead of taking, you know, the weeks it used to take to transfer a check. In a similar way, uh, this new trust over IP stack, this new verifiable credential technology, allows for us to have the same shift where a transcript can be verified on the spot, a skill or an achievement can be verified on the spot without um, all of the inefficiency that comes from uh, the traditional uh, a transcript on a piece of paper. <laughs> so, um, and so how do we begin this work? Really, it's about connecting our systems, right? So the idea here is that we have many different systems, right? Identity systems, learning management systems, HR and hiring systems, and each of those, uh, you know, are already connected into an internet. So why the internet of education? Well, the idea here is let's uh, move it into an access control network where we can have a trust and we can transfer that information in a way that doesn't, uh, you know, it, it doesn't hurt the privacy of the student and it doesn't sacrifice the intellectual property of the individual institutions. And so, and so from that, we create a value chain where we can start to move information through every silo and everyone can start to understand this lifelong learning progress, right? And this is really important because now we can start, I mean, when we have the data too, we can start looking backwards in this anonymous uh, safe data to understand which individual units are becoming skills and, and, and actually moving through to workplace advancement. Uh, and this can be extrapolated to every single influencer in the, 
in the life of a student. So this is really exciting because this means, uh, you know, um, amping up efficiency at every single silo of education and employment. And so how does this come together? You know, the idea here is there are many systems, right? And they make up, you know, the internet of education. There's only one internet, you know, there should be only one internet of education. This is a, a place where everyone should have equal access and, and, and have the learner should have control over their data, you know? And from there, there are many different nodes, right? Employers and, and the military and libraries and students and et cetera, everyone can connect and become a part of a network, a decentralized network, right? And so, and so where this takes us to is to start thinking about new infrastructure, right? So that's the vision, um, that's the blue sky, but how do we do this, right? When you think about new infrastructure, the best analog for this is the GPS ecosystem, right? I can really easily navigate to a sandwich, a uh, really great sandwich, I can find it and I can get to it quickly. We need to be able to have that same kind of GPS ecosystem to the career or to the life that I want through the learning pathways. And, and this isn't so easy today, but in the same way that the GPS didn't arrive overnight, it took many, like many years of infrastructure building. So we have to do the same thing with, with the internet of education. And so really it, in our mind, hangs on a couple of different networks or utilities, right? The first, we just need to get everybody online, right? Uh, it used to be, uh, a homework gap and now it's it's a critical gap you know there are students who don't have access to learning so let's solve that challenge so number two digital wallets right this is at the root of it so the idea is i'm a learner on my phone i should have access to all of my records right i should have it in one place uh, i should have so my lifelong learning all the way through employment i should be able to hold it to save it and in doing so it changes the psychology of learning because i'm collecting now and i know the assets that i'm earning so we're talking about in increasing efficiency uh, for graduations, you know, and for moving into employment, all types of things. Uh, and the idea is I should be able to transfer that to whoever I want and have total access over that. Next are skills libraries. We need better data down to the skills level, right? We need to know which skills are being earned as I'm completing courses. Uh, and we need to be able to begin to have taxonomies of those skills that communicate and are coherent across many different institutions in many different sectors. And from there, we need to be able to harmonize those skills, right? I need to be able to transfer my skills and my achievements and my transcripts to any school, employer, or university, uh, regardless of where I am, right? I need to be able to do that across the border. It's, it's about portability. And lastly, when you have all of that, now we can create this learning GPS, this stable GPS. I, I should be able to map my lifelong learning through the value centers, right? From school to test, to internship to credential. And I should be able to direct and redirect as my life changes and the world changes. And so if we do this correctly, then we create what's called a learning economy, which is really where Learning Economy Foundation found its name. The idea here is, is that a skill should have the same kind of currency as a degree, right? We should be able to quantify that and actually have that as a, you know, as a, as a deep inherent value market that we can start to build a new future on. And so that essentially is the is the Internet of Education. And I think Greg can unpack a little bit of the actual work that's happening, which is becoming incredibly thick these days. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Michael? Look, I think we can all agree that these times are unprecedented, um, for students and families particularly. The majority of students right now are attending classes, either completely or partially remote, and predictions of up to 20% of higher ed institutions are expected to fail this, this year. K-12 students are projected to average a 3% lower income over their entire lifetimes. So it's against this backdrop that the global internet education movement is really accelerating its momentum towards this new vision of learning that Chris just described. Through aligned technical standards, shared utilities, open source projects, and networks of collaboration pilots, um, innovators across the world are really creating this new ecosystem um, where all learning matters, mastery of skills can be verified, and alternative pathways become the norm. But the Internet of Education is not a product you can buy. It's an approach that all actors in an ecosystem need to make together and agree. It's what uh, Chris just referred to as a collaborative laboratory or a co- Very good, Michael. Thank you so much for this. And thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in Broward County. I'm going to share my screen for, um, to show you this uh, PowerPoint. And, uh, and so, uh, it, the algebra project is the, uh, I think the fundamental idea from the algebra project is that we accelerate and not remediate. Um, and so that will be a catchword as we go forward. The idea is um, to have innovative curriculum and pedagogy that um, accelerates students 
toward their goals in mathematics. It really is a part of the legacy of Bob Moses' work in the Mississippi theater of the civil rights movement and his work with, with voting rights in Mississippi and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, from the very beginning, Bob realized that education was being used as a gatekeeper to keep people from their actual voting rights and, and, and political empowerment. And it's from that, um, from the uh, organizing Freedom Summer uh, and realizing the role of education that uh, much of this work emerged. When he began uh, the work in the Alpha Project after receiving his MacArthur Foundation grant, um, he continued that work by finding innovative pedagogies and curricula we'll talk about here in a moment. But the Alpha Project goal is, is simply stated, that students in grades K through 12 who now perform in the bottom quartile in mathematics on standardized state exams have the opportunity to graduate from high school, able to do college and career mathematics without remediation. To do that well, you have to know what to teach, how to teach, and how to assess. And those are the keys because you have to engage students, you have to motivate students, and you have to reach them where they are. And so that is really all about the Algebra Project experiential pedagogy that Bob uh, really uh, created in the in the um, 80s when he was he had the MacArthur Fellowship and it starts with having an event a physical event or an event online some kind of event that's shared by the students and that those events actually once once the students have those events they reflect on them and uh, create a pictorial representation they do people talk feature talk and symbolic representations, but it actually just reverses the ordinary way that mathematics is, is taught. And so by starting with a, a concrete event, the students actually are engaged from the very beginning. A, a critical piece of the algebra project is having vertically accessible curricula, because we said, what do you teach? But what you have to teach are things that are accessible at all levels of of cognitive understanding for the students. And the, the uh, mathematically rich events that are the basis of the Alpha Project curriculum had that uh, ability to actually have um, students at, at various levels of, of mathematical ability to actually access the ideas in the curriculum. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that when we, when we go through the material with Territorium, and you'll see a perfect example of what we mean by a vertically accessible curriculum. But there's also the idea of how to assess, and that really um, is part of the great work that we're doing with ETS in building the next level of, uh, of assessments. And learning progressions are at the very heart of that. Um, so uh, learning progression is, is something where you are actually looking at students at various levels of cognitive development. Um, complex ideas in mathematics are, are learned at different stages. And so that building a learning progression is really part of that next level of, of uh, assessment that we're developing. Now, a learning progression has the potential to develop actionable information for teachers to guide instruction. And it starts with early intuitions, leads to novice ideas, intermediate thinking, target understanding. And those are the things that are at the basis of a learning progression. Again, you're going to see more of that when we go through the Territorium presentation. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Guillermo, who is going to go through that material with Territorium. Thank you very much, Greg. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and first, uh, I will give you a quick overview of what's the project and what we're working around the integration of Territorium uh, for increasing um, algebra and math proficiency in, um, uh, in Bower County public schools. Uh, so here are the project initiatives. Uh, we have assessment tasks based on, on learning progression, um, as uh, Greg said, with ETS, Algebra Project, and we're integrating these within our platform so that we can create personalized learning paths for these students 
uh, based on the assessment and based on what we're continuously learning from them, the digitalization of algebra project and young people project learning experiences so that uh, we can have a, a complete engaging experience within Territorium's platform as the experience is very engaging in the physical world uh, with all the activities that they do in YPP and we will see a little bit of that during our demo. Uh, we also working on teachers preparation and a scenario based learning with ETS deflets. Uh, we will talk more about it uh, during the presentation and also uh, we are preparing kids for math and algebra in the future, uh, securing a solid foundation and we will see this also with Durham University uh, and some assessment around math to understand the level of proficiency of young kids. So the technology project goals basically are digitalizing algebra and young people project activities and experience into an easy to use, engaging and adaptive platform. Uh, we are integrating also ETS resources around math and algebra learning on multiple school years and use AI to give users learning recommendations. So we are continuously understanding uh, through the content, through the uh, activities, and also uh, through the several. Um, uh, uh, assessment in the platform, uh, how the student is performing, we are continuously learning and giving recommendations so that they can improve. And basically, we are creating a comprehensive skills profile of the student in the math and algebra area so that we can create a comprehensive profile and integrate with a comprehensive learning record uh, that the school district is creating. So a little bit about Territorium, we have 8.5 million users worldwide. We work in the education sector. We also work in, in corporate learning, uh, focusing on creating an engaging and adaptive uh, learning platform in which we not only measure grades, but we are measuring the skills that students are developing. Um, we are looking forward to engaging them through gamification so that we can give them constant feedback, become recognized and obtain small wins in order to get a, a bigger one. And we create complete profiles based on skills with the evidence of how the students are developing those skills. So this is a great input for the comprehensive learning record. And here we are creating a complete portfolio of, of math and algebra for students since pre-K until high school uh, in the school district. Uh, we are also challenging students and we will see in the demo uh, how we create a challenge-based environment in which they are winning badges, uh, they are looking forward to get more evidence that they are developing the skills and uh, creating also engaging activities through gamification. And finally, we also look forward to communicate with parents so that parents can also see how their children um, are getting uh, better in their skills and also uh, looking at their progress on, on their mobile phones. So we are going to now to go to a demo of how this is integrated with the Territorium platform and the work that we have made uh, with uh, Algebra Project, Young People Project, um, and, and ETS. So first, uh, here we have a road coloring program so that students can understand better uh, how road coloring works. So Greg, can you explain us a little bit about this? Yeah, so th this is a perfect example, Guillermo, of a vertically accessible uh, curriculum. Um, so the road coloring problem is based on actually an unsolved problem in, in theoretical computer science, but is easily accessible um, by students at all ages. And it's the way that the Alpha project teaches functions. And so what you see before us is, is something we call a city that is built by the students, and then they actually can move around the city and the transformations they undergo are the basis for the idea of a function. And so um, what you see before you is, is something where if you have a, a road sequence, you would actually get everyone in, the, in the, the same place at the same time. The students have that physical experience and form the basis of function. And that will, you'll see all the different representations of functions in the assessment part that Aurora is going to show in a moment. So here I'm going to show uh, how this uh, uh, simulation works. Uh, so basically here we'll we run, this, run the sequence and the student, as Greg said, uh, will be looking how uh, the cars are moving through the city. Uh, 
So uh, he will have the example of the assessment. Uh, Aurora, you can explain us a little bit more of how, how this works. Yes, so what you're seeing is one of the assessment tasks running inside the Territorium platform. And one of the skills that is important to assess as students are learning about the concept of function is translation between equivalent representations. So on the left, you see a pair of arrow diagrams. And um, an equivalent representation is the directed graph that you see on the right. So students are using this interactive tool to create a um, equivalent representation in the directed gra graph to um, what's on the left, the arrow diagrams. Another equivalent representation is the matrix. And so here, students are translating between the pair of arrow diagrams to the pair of matrices. Here, there, here the task is assessing um, matrix multiplication. And it's worth mentioning that in the project, we scored uh, a number of these using automated methods. So uh, basically what we're doing here, we uploaded uh, these uh, uh, tests from ETS. Uh, we also integrated uh, automated scoring uh, so that we can give feedback to the user and also when the user submits the test based on their answers, we can also create for them a personalized learning path uh, so that they can also understand better uh, some of the questions, also understand better uh, some of the topics around this. So uh, now I will go uh, to an example of how students are learning prime factorization uh, within Young's People project um, and here we are working on uh, having a complete experience uh, for um, the, uh, the, the Young's People project related to Flagway and how uh, we are integrating within the platform uh, several tools so that the users uh, can play in the platform. There's a work in progress. Uh, we are also working on having a multiplayer for Flagway. Uh, however, uh, here, Maisha, you can give us a better explanation. Yes, thank you, Guillermo. So I'll say a little bit more, I'll say more about Flagway a little bit later. Um, but this is an example of the kind of game that we've created to help students build number sense. And so in this game, students match prime factor cards to their whole number. So on the card is the prime factorization of a number and the numbers are to be multiplied together. So two, three, and five combines through multiplication to make 30. Uh, two and 13, of course, goes through to 26. And the students can compete against each other or they can set a group goal and try to beat their group time. But the idea here is that students develop an understanding really of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which talks about uh, how every natural number has a unique prime factorization. So students are being exposed to prime numbers as the building blocks of, of the natural numbers. And so it's a much deeper exploration than just learning their multiplication facts. So I'll say a little bit more about the Flagway game. This is one of the activities that is part of our Flagway game. So uh, this is a way of we are into how we are integrating content and also we're adding some gamification so that we are creating tournaments uh, for students so that they can be uh, competing within themselves. They will be winning points, they will be winning badges for the activities that they are doing uh, within the platform, within the content, uh, and so that we can uh, have an engaging experience for them. Uh, also, we are creating a complete profile of the student uh, 
that shows their progress around the skills that they need to develop, the badges that they can earn uh, related to Flagway and the multiple games that they will be playing uh, for Young's People Project while they're learning algebra. So in each of them, we will see each of the achievements that uh, they should gain and they should show evidence uh, while they are working on, on this content. Each of these achievements are uh, get automatically from the activities, uh, from the assessment, from the content. Uh, and this is a big input for the comprehensive learning record. As on each of them, we will have the evidence related. Uh, the students will show, see their badges and they will also see their progress around uh, their skills development. So uh, this is a big picture of how uh, Territorium platform works and how we have integrated all the content and the assessment for creating a very engaging experience uh, for students around algebra and math learning. Uh, now um, I will move to uh, Peter uh, so that we can talk about how um, we are also integrating content uh, for young uh, uh, students around math so that we can secure a good foundation. Uh, Peter, do you want us to, to give us an introduction? So, um, I, I'm going to be talking here about um, mathematics in the early years, so before we move into the, into the school situation, uh, and I'm going to be talking um, really about how we will get children to be math literate at that very early stage. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to put up some key points about what I want to be saying. I'm going to talk about learning progression at that particular stage there. Then about the challenges of assessing young children quickly and accurately. Uh, and then some examples that come from the assessment fit into the learning progression and how we would gain it by this process. So the key points here is that we want to get good information about the kids, each individual child, to the teachers and to the schools and that we want to do it with a knowledge of the learning progression in mathematics so that we will do the assessment of the children and locate them along a learning progression but also that this assessment of young children is challenging um, but we've put the information into territorium and Guillermo is working on that almost as we talk um, and might be able to show some information in a moment. So what we want to do for the teachers to let them know by their own investigations what children know and can do. That means that the involvement of the teacher in the assessment is key to this. We could perhaps get an automated assessment and just give the teacher a number or a position. But actually by doing the assessment themselves, the teacher gets to understand the pupil in a much closer way and more detailed way. And by reassessing later, they can see how much progress they've made. In other words, they can see immediately what impact their own assessment has had or their own teaching has had. And at each stage, we can also give help to the teacher to say, well, this is maybe what would be a good thing to be doing at this stage of that child's development. So what are the challenges with young children and their assessments? Well, first of all, most at this stage don't read. So you can't give them a written bit of paper and ask them to read the questions. Secondly, they have a short concentration span so that you can't give them a, a two hour paper to sit down and work on. In fact, you want to finish this in about 20 minutes. And they have a short, short, short term memory. So unlike us adults with a um, short term memory of seven plus or minus two, many of those kids will be just two items. So that presents a challenge because if we want a reliable assessment, we typically think we want a long assessment or many items in it. And so we've got a, a clever way in which to deal with that issue. So first, let's look at the, the ladder, the learning progression. And we present it as a ladder to teachers there. And you can see starting at a very low level, moving up through advanced and that very low level, 
That will be the kids demonstrating that they know words like bigger, smallest, tallest, and so on. Um, and they might be able to read certain numbers like four, maybe they just have their fourth birthday. They'll move on through informal arithmetic, that's arithmetic without using signs like plus and minus, uh, but then on to the formal arithmetic, and maybe by that stage, they'll be identifying two-digit numbers, and then on to formal arithmetic, three-digit numbers, more formal sums, able to count on from where they've got two simple fractions, which is quite difficult at that early stage, and then on to really quite advanced levels of, of early maths when we're dealing with that. So let's look at some of the items here, and I'm gonna start with an example of that early maths vocabulary. That is at a very low level, and we'd show the kids this kind of picture we'd show to the, say to them, could you show me the biggest cat? Can you show me the smallest cat? And what we've got are a series of items to do with vocabulary, and we've got them ordered in difficulty. We ask the kid the easiest one, then a harder one, harder one, harder one, harder one, and we stop when they're finding a bit of difficulty. With more informal arithmetic, here are six ice creams. If I took four away, how many would I have? An example of a, a harder one, what number is that? And that's very hard for a young child to do, but some can do it, and as they're learning, they're moving forward. And then about the hardest one we would show, this is a formal arithmetic. I will show really fast uh, how also we have integrated this uh, content within the platform. So I will share my screen. Um, on one part, we have how the teacher looks at this uh, assessment. So uh, we are giving instructions here to the teacher, like, hey, show the child the pictures. Uh, the, I will show you know, in a little bit how the student looks at it. Um, and then as the teacher asks the questions, they can select if they are correct or wrong. What we're also adding uh, within the platform and is using uh, in another way, remote proctoring, but instead of using it for remote proctoring, that technology or that AI technology is also for understanding child's emotions while they are taking the test. And uh, while they are taking the test, the camera will be on and we will be looking and understanding their emotions. Uh, here are some examples of questions uh, related to Matt. Uh, Peter already showed some of the items. So while uh, the teacher is uh, moving uh, this on, on their screen, uh, the child is also looking, it can be in a tablet on our separate screen, they can also be looking to these uh, several uh, questions. So they're looking at the pictures only and the teacher is asking the questions and deciding if they are giving the right or wrong answer. So this is how uh, this is integrated uh, within the platform. Hello, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I, I know we have only a few minutes left, but let me... quickly say a little bit about our work around professional development. As Greg mentioned, the legacy of the civil rights movement, and particularly in the Mississippi theater, informs the work of both the Young People's Project and the Algebra Project. And so one idea emerging from that struggle is the notion that the people most affected by an issue need to be actively involved as part of its solution. And, and in this case, we're really talking about both students and teachers. I wanna say just a few words about our work specifically with teachers and the role of professional development in the collab in Broward County. In the Algebra Project, we're supporting teachers in making a fundamental change in their practice of mathematics, which in turn supports a change in how they teach mathematics. Teachers come to our PDs not to find a better way to teach something that they've been teaching many times before, teachers come to develop a different way of perceiving, thinking about, and eventually understanding the mathematics that they have been teaching, but that their students have not been understanding. For the algebra project, this means that teachers need to be involved in their own productive struggle with the contents of mathematics. 
as Greg was saying, we accomplish this by embedding the mathematics in concrete experiences that are accessible to all of us, but where the connection to the embedded mathematics is not at all obvious. Uh, to, to really excavate the mathematics buried in these, exper in these experiences, we work with teachers to develop a discourse and a culture in the classroom that is, first of all, safe and supportive. Really a place where teachers and students can make mistakes and grow from those mistakes rather than having those ideas labeled as simply being mathematically wrong. The heart of this discursive practice is that we use with teachers is based upon this five-step curricular process. And we have identified critical transition points in the curricular process where teachers scaffold uh, and support students, student discussions in moving from their everyday language to the conceptual and symbolic language of mathematics. In this curricular process, we, we do end up with the same standard mathematical result, but the road we take to get, to get there is very different from uh, the more conventional approach. The important feature of these shifts is that they are grounded in a resource that everyone, every student and every teacher has, namely the language that everyone brings naturally from their daily life. And finally, you know, over the past few months, COVID has crystallized the importance of being able to bring these features both to the professional development of teachers and the associated discourse and culture of the classroom online and in the virtual setting. We need to be able to bring not just the content of mathematics, but also the collaborative processes that teachers and students use in their classrooms into a remote setting. Establishing an online platform that supports this type of culture and this type of discourse is exactly the work that the Algebra Project and the Young People's Project has taken up with Territorium and our other partners. And so at this point, I'll pass it back. I'd like to share a little bit about the Young People's Project and a game that we play called the Flagway Game. Uh, the Young People's Project grew out of the Algebra Project. Uh, these were students, middle school students and college students who were former Algebra Project students who really found a way of learning that was empowering uh, when they were in the Algebra Project and they wanted to own a little piece of it. And so they started a separate organization called the Young People's Project, which involves uh, high school and college students uh, teaching math in a fun and engaging way to younger peers. One of the signature games uh, that they play is called the Flagway Game. Um, we mentioned it a little bit earlier. So the Flagway Game is based on the Mobius function, which category categorizes numbers into three mutually exclusive groups. And the game is played on this, uh, what we call the Flagway structure that you see here. It's a system of radial paths and the students have to crack the flagway code. So they have to learn the Mobius function and then they walk their numbers on the flagway structure. Uh, the game is played um, in teams. Uh, students come together, they fill out a flag, uh, they show all of their work where they assign the colors to the numbers, and then they run their flag on the flagway structure, relay race style. Um, it's a very energetic and physical and exciting game. Um, they cheer each other on. And as I mentioned earlier, they really do learn a lot of math along the way. Um, we've begun organizing a national flagway league where students come together in local and regional 
and even national tournaments. And these are elementary and middle school teams that are coached by high school students. Um, as I said earlier, the heart of YPP is really young people teaching other young people. And we think it's one of the best investments that a school district or a community can make, which is to invest in its own young people who are interested in investing in their peers. Um, we really see that parents uh, can tell so YPP parent um, talking about how she could see her daughter's thinking evolve um, and see her thinking like a mathematician. And students really do improve also in their math content knowledge. Um, some of the concepts covered are algebraic substitution, prime number recognition, um, greatest common factor least common multiple factorization, and we really do see significant gains uh, in the students. So um, I'd like to uh, thank you, and uh, we'll go to, to Bill. People this afternoon, we have uh, Alan Saffron, the President CEO of Saga Education, and who will be talking to us about the online tutoring and then uh, Joshua Marks, a senior advisor at Public Consulting Group, uh, who will talk to us about the data and the comprehensive learner records and the students' uh, self-sovereign identity as they go forward uh, with their records. Uh, Alan, tell us a little bit about the um, online tutoring. Will do, Michael, thanks for having me and thanks to ASU GSV for this uh, terrific conference. So Saga has been around six years, uh, came out of an idea from a charter school in Boston from 2004 that I used to be the director of, but it really comes out of an idea from several thousand years old that tutoring is a really good way to educate students. The issue with tutoring has always been, sure, it's a great idea, but how do you scale that? How do you make it cost effective? So Saga, uh, again, coming out of an idea out of Boston, is an idea that we build tutoring in the school day as a class on student schedule. It's not an after school afterthought. It's built into the schedule. We typically have done this for ninth grade algebra. We're now in Chicago, New York, DC, and, and in Broward County. We've worked in grades seven and eight. We've worked in grades 10 and 11. We've even done early literacy, but our core strength is ninth grade algebra one. And we've got a number of randomized control trials done by the University of Chicago that say it's among the most effective interventions ever rigorously studied in American high school. And the intervention is this. We take a tutor, recent college graduate, probably looks like someone who might have applied for Teach for America, or a mid-career switcher, or a retiree. We get 10 to 20 applicants for each position. It's a service position. They are paid, but it's, uh, we emphasize it's a service. And they spend the full academic year tutoring, six periods of a typical eight-period day, 180 days of a typical 180-day school year. And the ratio in, in our early days was one tutor to two kids. We changed to make it one tutor to four kids, two live, and two working on a platform physically next to them. Now in Broward County, because of COVID, and we're doing this in Broward and in New York, our tutors are completely online, never showing up at school, even if the kids do, but we have Saga staff in the room to supervise and support the kids. The idea is the tutor will have a platform. We use Whoop Tutor, which we've used for a year and a half with the College Board, also in a randomized trial, as our platform for delivering instruction. The platform is terrific, better than Zoom, better than Microsoft Teams, which are not platforms for tutoring at all. This is designed to tutor math, so expression keys are right there in front of us. Manipulatives are right there in front of us. Dice we're doing probably right there in front of us. Our curriculum is ingested into the platform so that it sits between us and the student, just like it would in the real world if we're sitting across a table, horizontally would be the curriculum that the student is working on. Here it's vertical on the screen in front of us. And there's a virtual whiteboard. So the student's work shows on the screen to the tutor, and when the tutor is tutoring multiple kids, he or she can show it to the other kids. They can talk to each other. They can point out what they see and what they don't see. That's what we're doing. And in Broward County this coming school year, we are serving 1,008 kids in eight of the high schools across the, the county, uh, mostly 10th graders who have failed the ninth grade end of course assessment or the ninth grade algebra one class. And therefore, they're at greater risk of not succeeding and not getting their graduation because algebra one is the gatekeeper to high school graduation. So that tool we use, this Woo Tutor tool, we're really excited about. Uh, it's been uh, our experience that if kids build relationships with a tutor, then they will be more likely to take the tutor's urging to put an effort to learn. And we feel that relationship is the core of what we do. Kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 
that's been our challenge from the start. That's how we structure the, the live, physical, in-person relationship, but it's how we've also structured the online relationship. We start with uh, growth mindset lessons and half mindset lessons, get to know our kids, get them to know us. We contact parents once, uh, at least once a month to keep them informed. And we're particularly excited as we enter uh, Broward for the first time in any of our jurisdictions to be working with an organization like the CoLab and creating uh, evidence in this comprehensive learner record that I'm really excited about. Never had that experience before, but our tutors have always collected data. We do a, a ticket to do now, question at the beginning of the period of tutoring. We do several questions at the end that measure whether the students learned, define that as either basically learned or proficiently or mastery learned, what the tutor worked on with them that period. We've always done that. We've used that data to help inform uh, the work of the next day based on the ticket to leave, but now part of the comprehensive learner record, I'm very excited that we'll be able to provide that directly to teachers. Teachers will be, be able to provide information to us. We think that's a really strong piece of the program that we're entering into in partnership with Broward County. And uh, in that regard, uh, over to you, Joshua. Yeah, thank you for that very good segue. That was very artfully done. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the mechanics of exactly how we do what Alan was just talking about. So I'm going to share a few slides to illustrate conceptually what's going on. Uh, the goal is to optimize the, the time the tutors are spending with the students and to provide for everybody involved, the teachers, the students, and the, uh, and the uh, tutors slash mentors. Uh, how to understand how things are moving forward, how people are progressing. So we do this by talking about learning pathways and maps. And the first, uh, at the beginning of the year, we uh, started to work with Broward County Public Schools to understand their instructional scope and sequence and their primary and alternate pathways for success towards algebra, which starts in sixth grade and progresses on through to you know, algebra one and algebra two. And somewhere in there, many students are getting lost or just simply not prepared at the sixth grade uh, to engage in the more complex work. So uh, we took the existing curriculum scope and sequence. We understood what skills are being taught in terms of in the terms of the state standards in Florida, the, uh, the uh, Florida uh, math standards now called the Florida best standards, uh, and how those skills and competencies are related to each other in the order in which they're taught in the curriculum, the units, modules, and lessons. So you can think about these little nodes in this map as the units and lessons that are taught in the primary or primary or alternate pathways towards math success. Now this happens to be the map for one unit and the concepts associated with linear equations and how they lead towards mastery in, in uh, grouping functions and linear equations. But the, the idea is when you give a student a, a placement assessment, you can see which of these concepts they've mastered, which ones they may have not mastered, or which ones they've demonstrated that they have a misconception about. And by presenting this map that the teacher kind of fills in through the teaching process, the mentor can see where to focus their attention in their in tutoring sessions. And as they provide a set of problems and solutions with the student on these uh, uh, problematic nodes, they can capture a competency assertion statement that updates the information on this map. And the competency assertion statement, which is the same information the teacher can provide in the class. So the teacher can say, I, the teacher, assert that, that uh, the student, Alan, has achieved a, um, a, a skill level uh, A uh, you know, on, on that linear functions at proficient based on the test score. So this is the information the teacher provides. But the, the mentor or tutor can do the same thing. I, the tutor, assert that the student has achieved uh, mastery of the skill uh, based on the, the problem sets that I worked on with them on Tuesday. Um, and all of that information collects in this hierarchical record of achievements. And there are many providers of those hierarchical records of achievements. There, there's the summative assessment systems that ETS provides to the College Board and others. There's their SAT scores, there's their PSAT scores in particular. The PSAT scores are critical because it really defines the placement of where the student is on that algebra uh, entry point. Then you also have uh, the learning management system. In Broward, this is Canvas. 
And uh, so teachers use assignments and assessments in Canvas to generate uh, parts of their score that they put into the gradebook. Those achievements can be aligned with the standards and be additional evidence of, of mastery or misconception that get collected through this assertion tool that we'll be building in Broward. It's a LTI tool and a web application that collects this data, formats it correctly, and pushes it into a database that contains the achievement records for all the students and all the teachers and all the mentors in Broward. Um, additionally, there's formative assessment tools that are provided that, uh, that collect assertions. And for those students that use PCG special education systems, there's co-curricular uh, RTI or, or, uh, or other um, support services uh, that are provided like the tutoring that can provide uh, uh, assertions into the system. This is particularly true for students with IEPs where they have their own uh, achievements that they, and goals that they're trying to attain that are separate or parallel or replace uh, equivalent achievements uh, in the curriculum. Uh, so all that data is collected through this assertion tool and stored in a, in a data warehouse, essentially, or a data ledger uh, for Broward. The student, at any point in time, has control of, of access to that ledger, and they can request through a student wallet application, uh, something on their phone or a web application uh, that we'll be providing in, in Broward, they can get all of their CLR data or a subset of them and place it in their wallet. They can also collect the CLR data from external providers like external tutors and work-based training programs like uh, a um, after-school training program for nursing where you can get certificates for elder care and other kinds of things that can collect in your student wallet. The student can then curate all of that information in a view kind of like their map or in a view kind of like their ledger uh, and provide that as information to an employer or, or their next college, Broward College, in the case of many students in, in Broward uh, County Public Schools. And they can create a, a, a secure view for Broward. So they basically create a uh, unique uh, identifier and passcode that they provide uh, to the admissions office. The admissions office can then view the data and verify each of the records back to the issuer, whether it be Broward or you know, the after school program or the tutor work-based training program. That way the student can maintain this data as part of their lifelong record and provide uh, views of this to different constituencies that, uh, such as their tutors. They can say, look, I, you're my math tutor. You really don't need to know what I, how I was doing in my phys ed class uh, or, or my health class. So I'm just gonna provide you a view of the part of my, you know, uh, my records that pertain to what you're tutoring me on. And Joshua, then, I'm, I'm, I wanna say we're just so excited to be part of this comprehensive effort to support students in Broward and I'm really looking forward to working with, with PCG on this. Right, so you know, this is, this is uh, how we are going to optimize the resources that are in the county to the, to the learning opportunities and, and participation of the student in their own, le own learning process. Because I think that is the subversive piece of this map is, once the student sees where they are and they understand what they can do to achieve their goals and how what they're doing now impacts their ability to achieve their long-term goals is how they become self-motivated, self-actuated learners. And Thank until you. they do that, they really can't. Thank you very much, Joshua. And Alan, thank you. It's very exciting. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this afternoon. Vince. All right, thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate the opportunity here. Um, at ETS, as we work with Broward County and think about our role in the CoLab, we're focused primarily on how we can support the implementation of a balanced assessment system um, to, to gather as much rich information about student achievement and progress as possible. So typically, with our work in states and, and districts, there's a, a lot of emphasis on high stakes uh, summative assessment and much less on a balanced system that includes a rich uh, formative assessment layer. So at ETS, our approach to addressing this piece of, of the assessment system uh, pie is that we first started 
uh, by developing a set of research-based learning progressions in mathematics and language arts on topics such as proportional reasoning or inquiry and research. And then we have taken that forward into uh, creating teacher resource guides, linking those learning progressions to state standards and providing some narrative descriptions and examples of how those progressions work to support a student progress. And then we move into the assessment piece, which is where we've uh, developed these scenario-based tasks that are designed to support the formative assessment process and tie together state standards with learning progressions uh, that we call testlets. Um, what I mean by scenario-based is we start the process with our research and development team storyboarding out a scenario on a topic such as cell phone dependence or solar eclipse or food waste that takes students through a, a, an individual learning progression to help understand their level of understanding, their depth of understanding about a given topic, such as proportional reasoning. We include a wide variety of technology enhanced items. We support uh, rapid scoring, so students and teachers immediately know how students have performed and where they are. And uh, we've also developed an application to support the construction of these uh, scenario-based tasks uh, and make them much more efficient and, and cost-effective to put together and, and deploy. Uh, so overall, you know, our goal is that um, these tasks will become part of a balanced system, uh, enable everyone you know, Broward County or other districts to be able to point to something that is clearly solidly in that formative assessment space that has low stakes and is all about understanding student achievement and really um, add different and, and important data points to help round out a, a more global picture of student achievement and progress. I'll pass it over to Guillermo to um, do a quick little demo there. Thank you, Vince. So we are going to show you a demo about uh, how the test lists work. Um, in this example, uh, we are going to see in a scenario for the student uh, learning about uh, proportions and ratios uh, using music. So I'm going to share my screen. Great, so here we are uh, launching the testlet. As we can see here, uh, this scenario is around uh, a music mixer. Uh, it's an interactive assessment for ratios and proportions. Uh, here uh, in the testlet, we can see how uh, we have initial instructions. Uh, it's very interactive for the student. Uh, for example, uh, here we have um, several music instruments uh, that first the user uh, decides to, to hear them. Uh, I think it's not hearing, we're not hearing, but uh, yeah, in this case, um, uh, the user can see each of the instruments. Then we'll go to the next part and can see how these instruments uh, mix together. And basically, there is a problem because uh, the student sees that they're playing at a different speed. And now uh, the student needs to work uh, around ratios and proportions so that the music uh, can sound well. Yeah, here is just an example. So uh, the user will be hearing the music, uh, ma managing the tempo of each of the instruments. Um, and it's a great scenario for the student understanding and uh, around ratios, ratios and proportion and how it can be applicable uh, to real life. Um, Beans, I don't know if you want to add something around this.
No, thank you, Guillermo. I think that covers it well. Uh, just as an example, and we have several of these uh, testlets that, that were developed. Thank you. Yeah, so basically this is a demo. We are working um, integrating several of the ETS testlets within the Peritorium ecosystem. Um, as we saw in other sessions, uh, we are integrating all this data uh, from the test lets, from other activities, uh, so that we can create a complete profile of learning of each of the users, and after this, create personalized learning paths for each of the students. So basically, this will be the demo. Uh, I will pass it back to Michael. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Thank you, Vince. Uh, now, why Gordon is uh, in the process of developing uh, in expanding his uh, development of uh, practice material for people who are taking praxis. Why? Can you tell us a bit, a bit about that? Absolutely. So uh, it, in the practice division, we are focused on ensuring that students have access to high quality educators. We've done that a couple ways over the last uh, few years. The first is the development of the Khan Academy Official Praxis Core Preparation, which is a free resource that we offer to all candidates that uh, take our Praxis Core assessment. And the second is the development of the Praxis Tests at Home solution, which is a solution that we developed in response to the coronavirus uh, shutdown in early March. Uh, traditionally, we have candidates that only test, uh, take our tests in physical test centers. But uh, with the reality of, um, of the pandemic, we had to figure out another way to help uh, teacher candidates to continue on their journey to the classroom. And so we developed a remote solution that they're able to, uh, to use at home in order to complete their certification requirements. Uh, and there's another exciting development that uh, I'd like to share uh, with, uh, with the group. Uh, and Andrew Feller will talk a bit more about that. Thanks, Wyatt. Uh, at PCG, we started a test prep business for teacher certification exams about five years ago. We noticed a fundamental gap of preparation for these exams at teacher preparation programs. Uh, these programs often teach theory, instruction, learning, but not direct uh, instruction around those exams. Because the exams are high stakes, if the candidates don't pass, they can't teach. So with ETS, we've begun developing a new learning product that is intelligent, adaptive, and autonomous to help uh, prepare teachers for these exams. The product will be low cost, equitable, and accessible to all learners. We'll also offer an extension of personalized coaching and support if the learner needs it. With these products, we'll test our hypothesis that this will be an effective means of preparing teachers for their licensure exams and thus addressing the pipeline bottleneck issues that perpetuate the teaching shortage. Drummond, uh, the, let me start with you. The Broward County Public School District in its collab is very interested in moving rapidly forward in uh, the Internet of Education and digital credentialing and self-sovereign identity. What can you tell us about this? Uh, that's, that's a great question, Michael, and uh, I'm going to share a few slides uh, to do that. Let me go to full screen here. So um, what Broward County is, is undertaking is, uh, we think, a wonderful example of where uh, what we call self-sovereign identity and the trust over IP uh, stack is going. So I'm going to take a second to explain that quickly. Uh, the basic idea behind uh, SSI is technically it's called verifiable credentials, but most of us would just call it digital credentials. And it's not, it's not a complex thing to understand. We all know how we prove our identity or show credentials um, in the real world today, right? We, we use wall, uh, a wallet and, and we, we, we show like we want to get on a plane, we go to an airport, we have to show the credentials that they need, we call them the verifiers, that have been issued to us by parties they trust. What we don't have today is a way to do that digitally. And we desperately need it. And, and once basically the cryptography, which was inspired by blockchain, uh, 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 the emergent blockchain technology, finally we recognized we could do this and we could do it on a global basis. So the standards for doing this have been coming into place for the last couple of years um, from W3C. 
And it's enabling us now to go from physical to digital credentials. And I'm gonna explain just a little bit about how that works so that it's, it's really clear what the potential for this is. Uh, this is called the trust triangle. It's a diagram from uh, the, what's called the Verifiable Credentials 1.0 specification at the World Wide Web Consortium. And that became a full standard last September. So, so we are well into uh, implementing this and, and having credentials out there in the real world. All of the credentials have an issuer they're issued to a holder that puts it into their, their uh, digital wallet. And then they present what's called a proof of that credential to a verifier. And interestingly enough, when you do digital credentials, you don't have to show the whole of a credential. You can only show what a verifier needs to know. For example, if, if you were you know, trying to enter a bar, uh, right today you have to show your whole driver's license. And that can be a, a, a privacy issue, whereas you'd only have to prove digitally you're over the legal drinking age there. Now, what makes this all possible digitally is this piece in the middle called the verifiable data registry. And that's because there is cryptography underneath the whole thing. And to explain that briefly, I'm just gonna show this ticker toy version of the trust triangle. Uh, again, issuers issue to holders and, and, and they provide proofs whenever a, a credential is needed to a verifier. Um, the, the role that blockchain technology plays is, is with this uh, a second W3C standard called DIDs, Decentralized Identifiers. What it allows is for an issuer to make a transaction to a blockchain to actually write a public key, other cryptographic metadata from a key pair that they control, which means that the, as I take it through, um, now anyone's gonna be able to verify uh, that, that, that issuer. And so the issuer, well, now they're gonna issue a credential uh, such as a, a learning credential uh, to, to a, a student, for example, um, the issuer is able to digitally sign that credential with their private key. Now, that credential goes into the student's uh, wallet, and that's a digital wallet on any device they have. Obviously, smartphones are the, are the, are the, are the typical um, uh, form factor. And uh, the holder now is able to go to a verifier and uh, a verifier who needs a proof of one of those credentials. Now, that the user experience for that, anyone who's used a mobile boarding pass knows exactly what that's like. You're literally taking up, you're scanning a QR code and, uh, and, and, and they're getting the, and you approve, yes, I will, I will share this proof. When the proof is shared with the verifier, it has that DID from the issuer. So the verifier knows they use that to read from the blockchain, the pr public key and other metadata needed and they can verify the proof that that is a credential from that issuer, it hasn't been tampered with or changed and it's bound to that holder. Provided that that works and that the verifier trusts the issuer, everything is accomplished. You have the same thing as a physical credential with actually much higher assurance and no integration is needed at all between the verifier and the issuer. We're able to break out of the current limitations of federated identity architectures. So this is the basic idea behind digital credentials that can be used any place in the world. Um, and and it's, it's all being, you know, again, the two standard, basic standards we need are already uh, once fully done at W3C and DIDs is, is almost finished and it's being widely implemented out there. Now I wanna point out two other things that are critical, I think, to understanding this, which are, um, the, uh, the holder is able to, each time they establish a, a, a new relationship, they're able to, to exchange uh, public keys and, and DIDs privately in what we call peer dids. So one happens here, and then when the holder connects with a verifier for the first time, the same thing happens here. The important part about this from a data protection standpoint is all the exchange of private information uh, between individuals, issuers, uh, uh, <coughs> Individuals, so the issuers or verifiers happens above this line, meaning off chain, it's all GDPR compliant or compliant. It's, it's, it's very private, very secure and controlled by uh, the, the individual holder of those credentials, such as learners. So this is just built into the architecture. I call it privacy by design at internet scale. Um, many people wonder, well, can, where do biometrics fit in this? They actually fit in very nicely. The, the biometrics you use with a device like a, a, a fingerprint or a facial scan can actually strongly confirm you are the holder of that wallet and that credential. And lastly, there's a key role for what we call for governance frameworks here. It's a second trust triangle um, that allows a whole network or ecosystem of issuers, holders, and verifiers to, to trust each other I'll give you a wonderful example because he's about to speak. 
Uh, today in the real world, uh, MasterCard is a governance authority for a worldwide network of credit cards. Banks, credit unions, and others are issuers of those to holders called card holders who provide proofs of those credentials to merchants to buy uh, merchandise. This is one of the largest trust networks in the world. Now, MasterCard is recognizing, hey, this can and should work for digital identity as well. Now, if we want to apply that to what we call the Internet of Education that Broward County is helping to, uh, is a wonderful example of, then uh, the governance authority there, whoever, you know, as the Internet of Education comes together, and I, hopefully uh, ETS, ASU, and others are going to play a major role in that, that's the governance authority. Um, all the educational institutions that might be accredited, that could be a federated uh, system or whatever, are now going to be issuers that can issue to learners of any kind who, for instance, could go to employers now, and employers, by referencing that governance framework, can, can verify that's from an accredited educational institution any place in the world. So this is the basic idea behind digital credentials. And we have now taken this, the technology behind this, and it's, it's turned into a four layer stack. It's called the trust over IP stack, very much like the TCP IP stack that we use that enables us to have the internet. We're now trying to standardize how trusted digital credentials can be exchanged any place on the internet with this four layer stack. And I'm pleased to say that Trust over IP Foundation was uh, launched at the Linux Foundation in May, the first week of May. 27 companies were now up to 120 companies and over 200 individual members participating at the Linux Foundation. And uh, uh, ASU, by the way, is one of them. And uh, we, we would very much uh, love to have ETS and the, and the folks uh, that are part of this uh, conference be part of that. Um, and, and this is the mission here. So uh, MasterCard is one of the founding members of that foundation. And I'd like to hand off now to Stu, who will tell you about the business models that Trust Over IP makes possible. Shamoon. So just to reinforce really uh, what, what Drummond has shared around the current model for payments, right? And, and MasterCard's role in this is really critically around governance, right? And, and establishing the legal, the business, and the technical uh, rules, the gives and gets among the different participants in the network. Uh, so, as Drummond pointed out, really, you've got banks issuing uh, cards to holders of wallets, to the card holder, and then to the verifiers being the merchants um, of these, each of this network. So, really, you know, it is very user-centric, right? The card holder is, can, can use that credential, that card, anywhere they go, any merchant they go to, it's accepted. MasterCard, in this case, is providing the overall governance, the rules, uh, the management of those credentials uh, to, to the banks, et cetera. So that's the basic model that exists today. Now when we look at educational test credentials as an example, same model really applies quite nicely in a decentralized ID framework. Um, you've got employers as verifiers, for example, who want to verify that, that Drummond holds a certain degree or has, has taken a certain test as the student. Uh, that credential has been issued by ETS, say, for a test result, and that could be verified by a governance of authority. Could be a consortium, uh, really depends on the nature. Could be some Internet of Education group. Um, MasterCard could play a role in that, but really our, our involvement in all this is very much focused on identity and core identity verification of, of individuals. And now to get into the, just to describe the business model concept around SSI and how this would apply. Uh, the verifier in this case is basically providing, you know, they're paying for that credential. So the value exchange has the verifier um, essentially paying through the holder because transactions always occur through the actual holder, the student in this case, uh, asserting their test credential to the, to the employer. But the, the payment is actually a, a portion of that payment is paid to the issuer for issuing that educational test credential. And, and essentially that, let me go back, that model so equally applies here that um, the issuer, in this case ETS, gets, gets reimbursed, gets value every time that credential is used. The governance authority for the network is getting some fee, could be percentage, could be fixed fee, whatever that is, to manage the whole network and, and provide the trust framework and overall ongoing governance, dispute management, and things like that. 
the students in this case, the applicants shouldn't be paying anything, right? They're just um, holding their wallet and, and providing, uh, tra transiting that trust uh, from the, the issuer to the verifier. So fairly simple and straightforward. Um, the idea here is that the one who's getting the value, the verifier is paying uh, the issuer essentially uh, with, with some small portion going to a governance authority. Thank you very much, Grumman and Stu, for that uh, explanation. Um, Vladimir, this system that Grumman and Stu are describing could replace student transcripts and the admissions process and the way people uh, own their own credentials and move into the labor market and so on. How is this playing at ETS? How will it affect ETS? Well, that's a good question. Thank you, Michael. Uh, well, so just to give you some background, we at ETS have been experimenting with digital credentials for about five years, and, and the technology sounds very compelling to us from, from several points of view. And just to name a few, digital credentials are machine readable, right? And so they can be shared between systems and analyzed more easily than paper or even PDFs. Uh, with help of many digital wallets, the, they're easily storable and shareable. Uh, they are instantly, in many cases, uh, independently verifiable, which is also a limitation in, in some of the existing ways of score communication. Um, and it helped bring out the motivational aspect in the agency in achieving the learner's goals. So, so last year we've completed two technical prototypes. Uh, one is based on the open badges framework and the other one is based on the block sales technology. Uh, that anchors digital credentials in the blockchain, and we've been uh, we've been talking about potential for adoption of similar technologies uh, with ETS business leaders. So to sum up, the, the we are very excited about at ETS about the technical developments in this space, and I think I think for the next steps we should be talking to or at least starting to have conversations about both becoming the part of the ecosystem and join in organizations such as Trust or IP Foundation. Uh, also, uh, you know, to play the active role in development of interoperability standards and to find the, uh, to be able to find the appropriate application of these technologies in our products and services. I'm delighted for this concluding session to be joined by Bob Moses of the Algebra Project, the founder of the Algebra Project. Uh, Dan Goal, the Chief Academic Officer in the Broward County Public School District, and Joan Wynn, uh, who is a member of the Florida of Flame, the Florida Local Alliance for Math Literacy and Equity. Uh, Bob, you've heard a lot today about the technology uh, to accompany the Algebra Project curriculum and and um, assessment you've heard about uh, in the Broward County Collab. Give us your thoughts. What advice do you have for people working in the Collab? Yes. So, um, so I I think about these um, in relationship to um, a similar problem uh, that arose in the 1960s around voting in Mississippi. Uh, there's, on the one hand, the equity issue, uh, which in 1960s Mississippi was the caste system uh, for um, African Americans. Uh, and then there's the other hand, there's uh, actually the documentation and credentialing of what is going on, uh, which the main uh, group doing that was the Justice Department, right? So I think of ETS as um, having the role of the Justice Department in Broward County around this issue of credentialing and assessment. Uh, and, and I think of um, the Algebra Project and the Young People's Project of having the role of the SNCC field secretaries, um, which is exposing um, the actual existence of this caste system in the education system. So um, this is a huge problem. 
uh, to get these two together. In other words, for this to work, um, um, because the Alger Project owns the equity issue, um, Broward County doesn't own it, the Colab certainly doesn't own it, uh, ETS doesn't own it. Um, uh, the Alger Project's presence is absolutely necessary, right? But the Alger Project's presence uh, can only be valuable and meaningful if there's real attention to, well, how is it that we measure what we value, right? And so that issue um, of the measurement itself, apart from the understanding of what is we value, the issue of the measurement lies with ETS in this case. So this is a huge issue. It, it, um, it's all over the place, uh, as uh, tried to indicate from Mississippi. And so that's my concern. How, how do these things, um, how does the ETS uh, take a stand on this? And how does the work of the Alger Project actually uh, get the support that it needs, right, uh, in this uh, effort for math literacy? Michael, you're on mute. And Joan, give us your thoughts. So, um, so I was asked to talk about another piece of, of the collaborative, which you mentioned already, Michael. Um, it's uh, the part of the, uh, uh, it, it really started with Broward Public Schools, Florida International University, the Algebra Project, and the Young People's Project, and it was formed in 2016. And we call it FLAME, but it's connected to the National Alliance, We the People, Math Literacy for All. And like We the People, FLAME is rooted in the ideals of the Southern Freedom Movement, and especially the uh, work that Bob just cited, the legendary civil rights work um, that he did in Mississippi. And FLAME is rooted in that as well. Um, but it actually started with FIU's 16 year collaboration with Algebra Project and Young People's Project and then grew primarily through its partnership with Broward. And so it now extends to 15 other organizations. And Flame's work is driven by the voices of teachers, students, and communities who explore how to co-create with experts in the field, rich and rigorous math curriculum and professional development for all marginalized teachers and students. And those voices center our work because we believe, as do Bob Moses, Superintendent Robert Runzee, and Dan Goal, that demands must be made on the system by those for whom the system does not work. And much like the National Science Foundation's new focus on equity and inclusion, FLAME represents the demand that all science, math, engineering, and technology must deal with issues of equity at every stage of innovation. But equity cannot be just a conversation or empty rhetoric or simply technology that dazzles. It must come from a solid reckoning, from holding our feet to the fire of justice. Nothing else is worthy of our teachers and students. And indeed, democracy depends on that reckoning. Dan Goal, I'm gonna conclude with you. This has been a spectacular day. You've got some interesting and innovative activity underway in this Broward County Public School District collab. 
I, I want to thank you for uh, starting the CoLab. You've got some exciting times ahead of you this year. So Michael, yes, we do. And I hope that all the participants in our virtual summit over the last 90 minutes have come to see that there are many players who share our values, who are working with intensity and urgency to change our educational system for the students that are in it today. We need not wait for the students of tomorrow to change the system that we have. I wanna give big shout outs to our partners. Thank you for all the partners who are on the Internet of Education, for Saga. But I wanna acknowledge that we are not the initiators of this work. We are the inheritors of it. So Joan Wynn, Bob Moses, thank you in particular. Michael Nettles, your work in bridging educational practice with public systems and HBCUs and all of higher ed. We really have an opportunity in front of us. And in spite of our COVID pandemic, we need to move now. Broward County Public Schools is gonna make great strides this year. I hope that participants in this will initiate such work in their own communities and know that we are standing ready to struggle with you arm in arm as we move forward. We can do this work. Equity and excellence is more than rhetoric. It is action. Thank you. So that concludes our program. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Joan. Uh, and thank you to all the participants in this session. Thank you very much.